Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, third seminar um, we are offering as the Green European Foundation, together with Transition Verde and supported by the European Parliament on UBI, on Universal Basic Incomes. We have had already two uh, seminars here and uh, web uh, seminars, and now today is our third one, and we will talk about pilot projects on UBI. We really are happy that you are joining us, that you are follow with us the debate. Uh, I will introduce you, you in a moment, the two speakers of the day uh, and how we organize ourselves. But just to say a few sentences before, before because the uh, Green European uh, Foundation is working already since a longer time uh, on universal basic income. By the way, my name is Susanne Riga. I'm one of the coordinators uh, of the UBI uh, transnational projects uh, for the Fundación Nus, uh, Nus Horizons in, in Catalonia. So we have, uh, during this year, we have produced a lot of materials, about a lot of studies, uh, one uh, brochure about uh, Europe, about uh, the, the, the projects and the ongoing debates on UBI all over Europe. We have a, a, another publication about the COVID impact uh, and the debates on UBI. All this, you can find it on our uh, website of uh, Jeff, uh, what is a, pl a place where you can find a lot of information and uh, uh, beside of the publications and beside of the recordings of the seminars, also an online course uh, on uh, uh, UBI, where I will refer at the end of, the, of this meeting again uh, for. So we are happy uh, to join with you this and to uh, follow up with the debates because we think that UBI is a really important topic uh, in, uh, in not only in Europe, in principle uh, worldwide, but we as foundation are focusing and focusing more on the European uh, side. So I would like to introduce you our two speakers. And uh, first of all, uh, we have um, we have here with us at the moment. You don't see him, but you will hopefully there he is back uh, uh, with the photo with the camera on. Uh, you have uh, Mike Danson. Uh, he is uh, an economist, professor emeritus of uh, enterprise policy in of the Harriet Watt University, visiting professor uh, in energy policy of the University of Strathclyde and follow of academic of social science. So he has a, a long background in the in the science area has published a lot of books. But I think for today, the most important is uh, that uh, Mark is the chair of ba the basic income network of Scotland, and the chair also of Bien, uh, the basic income earth network um, of the World Congress in 2021. So uh, we will have here an expert from Scotland who will give us later an, uh, an up view, an update on the pilot uh, which is going on in Scotland. But before we go to Scotland, we stay uh, in Spain. Uh, and here I'm really happy that we have uh, Julian Balain with us, uh, a Spanish also economist, uh, politician and researcher uh, specialized in the, uni in the unconditional basic income. He has been elected uh, and has been politician in the Basque, uh, in the Basque uh, Parliament uh, for a time. Uh, and now he's professor in the university, has done his PD, uh, uh, PhD on uh, universal basic income. Uh, and will give us today an overview uh, of one uh, clear uh, pilot we have had in Barcelona. Uh, uh, but not all, only this, he also, as he has worked part of, uh, of the uh, course, of the, um, of the online course we have done in Jeff, he has a big overview also over all different other pilots about it. So we will start with a concrete uh, example and then we will widen up and then we go into the second part also with the, uh, with the Scottish view. The idea is that we heard here now first the two speakers, and uh, after this, I will open up the floor for you for, for questions, for debates, and uh, to see how we can um, follow up and, and move in this, uh, in this sphere of pilots in the uh, UBI debate. Uh, 
But first of all, Julian, the floor is yours. Welcome here with us. You still have your micro in silent. Yeah, you know, sometimes happens. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, thank you very much to, to the Green European Foundation. It's always a pleasure to, to be with you. And I'll try to be on time <laughs> as always. You know, it's sometimes difficult, but we'll try. Uh, okay, yes, you said, Susan, uh, we have uh, done that course that it's on the Green European Foundation page about basic income. And there we, uh, you've got all the information about different projects. So I try to focus on Barcelona's, uh, but if you have any questions or whatever about other pilot projects, uh, you of course can can ask them. All right. So uh, I think uh, before examining uh, that project and and the results, I think it's um, interesting to take a short break to speak about uh, the referendum that took place in Switzerland in 2016, because it was for the first time. Um, where an entire country uh, voted in a referendum for or against a basic income, the implementation of a basic income. Yeah. And the proposal was, um, well, it was due uh, monthly basic income of 2,500 uh, Swiss francs that, um, in their words, uh, would allow the entire population to live a dignified life and participate in public life. All right. It was rejected with the 76.5% of voters against, but it took 23.1% uh, uh, of voters in favor. And this reject, re rejection, let's say, it was predictable, of course, but uh, despite this rejection, uh, I think do, that we have to understand that the referendum was such an important step forward, okay? Um, of course, as I said, the reaction was predictable uh, because well, the national leadership of almost all parties in Switzerland, uh, including the Socialist Party, uh, recommended voting no. Yeah, the only exceptions were the Green Party and the politically insignificant Pirate Party that recommended voting yes, uh, and some cantonal, uh, let's say, branches of Socialist parties uh, in the three linguistic areas. But the result was expected. Uh, but it's not bad, however, to um, repeat that one out of four people voted for a basic income. And there were peaks of, for example, 35% uh, in the canton of Geneva, 36% in the canton of Basel city, and 40% uh, in the city of Bern, and some really, really important, 54%, uh, more than a half, uh, in some central districts of, of Zurich. Yeah? So, What's even more important for me, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, this referendum allowed uh, a lot of people to hear for the first time the concept of basic income. So in the days uh, leading up to the referendum, uh, the Economist, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, uh, New York Times, The Guardian, and so on, uh, well, were forced to publish articles trying to explain in depth the concept of basic income. Some of them did quite well, some of them didn't so well, but uh, they tried to explain what basic income was all about. So uh, this expansion, this led to an expansion of, of the concept of basic income. So if we want to understand where basic income has gained, uh, in my opinion, a larger space, both in the political, the academic or the public opinion uh, agenda, I always say that we have to look at least at three factors. The first one, the failure of minimum income programs. The second one, the evolution of the labor market. And the third one, the um, proliferation of pilot projects or experiments throughout the world. Uh, when speaking about uh, Barcelona, we have spoken so much about Finland, Kenya, Namibia, uh, Canada, the states in the 70s and so on. Um, when speaking about Barcelona, we have to speak about uh, BIM income, it's called BIM income, of income taken from Canada, yeah, and it's a 70 million pilot project carried out by the, by the Barcelona City Council, and uh, it's co-founded by the European Union's uh, Urban Innovative Actions, which is, um, well, yeah, it tries to provide resources to, to find new solutions to, to address different urban challenges we have in the 21st century. And uh, this BEM income strategy was based on testing a guaranteed minimum income together with 
uh, active social policies. This is not basic income, of course, but in addition, there was uh, an income modality without any active social policy. Yeah? It could be similar to a basic income. So this objective, the objective of the program was to improve the socioeconomic situation of these households, uh, evaluating the impact that different public policy designs can have on the capacity of uh, households to emerge stronger and uh, to overcome vulnerability and dependence on both public and uh, private resources to cover their basic needs. So uh, I'm trying to, to uh, share my, my uh, screen here. Can you see it? You yes. see this? Yeah, so this is uh, the Besos Axis uh, in Barcelona, which is one of the most private uh, poor neighborhoods in, in Barcelona. And this is where the uh, experiment was carried out. Um, so it was taken, uh, we can see a little bit down, if I go a little bit down, how the program was uh, a structure. All right, so uh, the treatment groups were uh, a structure in according to four participation modalities. What is a uh, conditional modality? There were 531 persons, numbers are not good there. Uh, Non-conditional, there are 419 uh, households, sorry. Uh, limited modality and uh, non-limited modality. Okay, and there are four active policies. As I said, it's quite complex, this program, this experiment. So the first one is um, targeted to 152 uh, households. It's a training program and municipal employment plans. Second one, uh, active policy uh, targeted to 99 households. It's a program to promote cooperativism and the social and solidarity economy. Uh, the third one is uh, targeted to 10 households and it's a housing renovation program that means that homeowners uh, have the opportunity to rent out rooms and to obtain a uh, higher return that Julian, can improve uh, yep. one request can you put the graphic a little bit bigger yep i Up try to, to put it on the full screen this works maybe it's better in full screen yeah, right, okay. Screen, yes. um, this way? No. I... Yeah, all right. It's this graph, okay? Okay, and the third one, uh, as I said, housing renovation program. And the last one, uh, targeted to 2,070 households, is a community participation program. Okay, so uh, these activities and programs uh, were um, intended to lead uh, to improvements in social relations and interactions, uh, to improve employability skills, and to uh, project development and decision making and social responsibility. Okay, but it was also launched. Uh, well, it was called REC, uh, R-E-C, and this is real economic uh, currency. It's a, an electronic city, uh, citizen currency, and this was uh, targeted to virtual payment methods uh, designed to promote the transformation of uh, urban, social, and economic models. Okay, this tries to, let's say, generate uh, new economic circuits, uh, revitalize, of course, small businesses, and to promote um, some way um, a circular e economy, right? So which were the results of, uh, of this? Uh, how can I go no, this? All right. Which were the results uh, we obtained from, from this uh, project? First, we obtained an, some improvements in key aspects such as uh, reduction in severe material deprivation and uh, food insecurity. Mm, this means also reducing, redu reducing sorry, uh, the impacts of rent and mortgages among households. 
okay? And reducing the need to ask family and friends for money. Secondly, we obtain a significant increase in the degree of uh, satisfaction with life. And we have also seen that result in other projects. Uh, an increase in the sense of belonging to the neighborhood that is really good because basic income is not divisive socially, okay, in those who give and those who receive. And uh, we also obtain a greater generation of links between participants and social workers based basically on less uh, assistentialism policies. And third, there also uh, we obtain an improvement in the sales of local and proximity business. On the other hand, it's true that some of the expected impacts uh, weren't confirmed. For example, that some impacts we have seen in other um, experiments, such as uh, the health dimension, um, we didn't confirm significant improvements in the health dimension. Secondly, uh, it was found that participation in active policies of the BEM income didn't stimulate uh, the willingness to entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship, sorry. Uh, this is something uh, it was confirmed in Kenya, for example, but not here in Barcelona. And third, um, well, contrary to what um, people might have imagined, this experiment uh, doesn't seem to have any significant effect on the likelihood of enjoying a greater individual leisure. Okay, that's something also that has been confirmed in other uh, experiments. And finally, this is something paradoxical, but the citizen currency uh, doesn't seem to have succeeded in strengthening the network uh, between neighbors, entities, and businesses, because also consumers uh, express a greater trust in those businesses associated with the uh, uh, citizen um, currency. The businesses uh, do not confirm this, this perception. So um, finally, um, or closing, I think that we have, or we must be aware that uh, although the, the results obtained um, through a pilot project are useful somehow uh, to show and to evidence certain interesting data and aspects, um, and they usually have uh, at least five major common limitations uh, that don't allow us to appreciate uh, the effects that a, well, a whole basic income could have um, on the citizenship and Mm, but did that lead us to mm, treat those results with care, all right? So first, uh, and this is evident at first sight, uh, it's that pilot projects are limited in time, all right? The result of the limitation in time is that it's not possible to analyze people's behavior in the same way as if they have a guaranteed material existence uh, throughout their lives. This well, one of the results of Barcelona was that maybe the health uh, health staff could be uh, another another thing, or the result could be another one if uh, the, the pilot project was not limited in time. Secondly, uh, we have to take into account that a sample of the population uh, is usually used to carry out the program. Okay, a sample that is usually not significant and uh, that cannot be generalized to the total population because it tends to be. Uh, saturated. For example, in Finland, uh, there were long time unemployed people. Okay. Thirdly, and yeah, taking in mind that a sample is usually chosen, uh, we have a problem uh, that comes from the impossibility of including net contributors to the system. All right, people, that uh, if we would finance a basic income through a fiscal reform they would uh, end up losing, okay? They would pay more taxes. So pilot projects uh, have zero tax effects. And fourthly, since pilot projects uh, do not include people who are not contributors to the system, they are financed uh, through subsidies, uh, budgetary finance, uh, or donations, all right? And finally, and due to the time uh, limitation, uh, the effect that uh, basic income could have on the labor market, for example, that is something uh, we basic income advocates um, make a lot, of, a, a lot of effort in, in studying that uh, is not uh, or cannot be observed uh, through, through pilot projects. So even though knowing that there are some limitations, uh, of course, pilot projects and experiments all around the world uh, are, mm, yeah, 
to a great extent, one of the most significant um, items that led us or led a lot of people to know about the concept of basic income. And as I said, a lot of newspapers to, to open uh, more than once uh, with, with basic income on the, on the front pages. No? So I think we have to know and put, uh, give a lot of, uh, yeah, well, a lot of um, value to those experiments knowing uh, every time mm, that they have some limitations and that we cannot overcome that, that limitations. So 40 minutes, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, uh, I, I have seen that there is a question uh, um, uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, as it is a quite specific one, maybe I can, you can, if you can answer it directly, can you read it directly? So the question is, um, how have the health uh, effects been assessed in the Barcelona Trail? Which component of health, physical, mental, social, spiritual has been included in the assessment? Um, maybe we can, if it's possible to answer this directly and then uh, we go to the uh, Scottish uh, uh, example and then we have a, a, a broader debate about it. Yeah, well, but it was uh, both physic or physic, I don't know how to say, and psychological health. All right. Mm -hmm. we, we can go further or deeper later on. OK, OK. OK, so let's uh, stop here and we take it back uh, when we when we talk in generally later. So I thank you very much, uh, Julian. And I, I would like to give the floor now to Mike to present the uh, example of Scotland. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for the invitation and hello everybody. Um, the, you, you gave my, my various titles earlier. Um, one thing to say within Scotland, we have a lot of leadership around basic income, both from, from the Scottish government and it became very clear during COVID, during our lockdowns last year, that the Scottish government was in favour of basic income and was arguing for it to be introduced. But we've also seen people from below um, through our various citizens' assemblies, people's panels and so on that, that the people um, are arguing for basic income. So we have this both from above and from below. The, um, okay, you're seeing my second screen now, hopefully. Um, we, we, as Chair said, we held the, the world the Global Congress in Glasgow this August. It was the biggest ever meeting of people in favour of basic income. Um, a thousand speak, uh, sorry, a thousand delegates, two hundred and fifty speakers, and so on. Again, there were leading politicians from across the UK and beyond were in favour. Um, the the co-author with Pope Francis of his book on basic income spoke, as did others, and we had world agencies. Uh, we covered such issues as COVID, the climate emergency, both of which people were arguing basic income has a major contribution to make um, in Scotland, but also right around the world. Um, we believe basic income can address poverty and inequality. And there was a lot of talk about advocating and networking by basic income groups. So it's well embedded into Scottish society, the Scottish economy, but also beyond. Um, all those presentations and papers and so on are, are still up online and I've put the link in there. It was interesting that in some of the sessions we had the United Nations, UNIDO, UNESCO, World Bank and so on. People from these global agencies talking in favour of basic income. And now, of course, started yesterday, COP26 is in the same city, but... And that but's important that Scotland as such is not at the table at COP26 and we don't have the powers to be able to implement basic income. And I'll return to that near the end. The, the, the mission statement we had for the Basic Income Congress, which we created as the, the organising team with our volunteers, stressed about human rights that basic income should be part of a, the basic human rights, 
most countries have signed up to the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which includes the right to be free from poverty, insecurity, and so forth. And, and of course, we argued in favour of base income. Um, the Scottish Government and the Parliament increasingly has taken a rights-based approach to many aspects of our economy and society. So again, base income is very much um, consistent with that. So where did all this interest and support for basic income come from in Scotland? Well, there were a few of us who'd been working it for, for many years, but in 2017, the Scottish Parliament Social Security Committee became interested and asked for evidence around these fundamental questions. What level of basic income should there be? How would we fund it? And could Scotland introduce it here based on our current devolved powers? So we have the Westminster, the UK Parliament, um, which is Supreme Parliament, um, holds a lot of powers, but some have been devolved to the Scottish Government and similarly to the Welsh, uh, the Welsh Assembly Government, to Northern Ireland and, and to cities in England. Um, around that time of forwards, we had, as I said, people from below arguing for base income. We and others created this group within the Scottish Parliament across different parties to argue in favour. And all of that led to the Scottish Government establishing a feasibility study group um, in 2018. And that was from four local authorities who were interested in running a pilot to basic income from our National Health Service, the Improvement Service, which serves to improve the professionalism of public um, civil servants and so on. So all of that was supported by the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament to undertake a study into how feasible would it be to have a citizen's basic income in Scotland, in pilot areas, and then across the country. And again, I've put links at the bottom of our own organisation, Basic Income Network Scotland, um, those who published the feasibility study, basicincome.scot, and Jamie Cook, who has sent his apologies, he was going to be speaking today from the RSA. Okay, so again, a lot of academic and rigorous research underpinning the work before the feasibility study. The feasibility study was a, a two-year project. It published last June. Um, it was really widely recognised um, in Scotland, across the UK, uh, within the basic income network globally, has been a very robust and rigorous piece of work. It was quite extensive. It's way over 100 pages. Um, it was a very sober reflection as well of what would be the challenges and difficulties of introducing a basic income into Scotland. It was accompanied by a very technical um, economic modelling approach, both in a macro model and also a macro uh, sorry, a micro model and also a macro model. And it was iterative, so these work back and forth between each other to create the first wave of looking at what the potential impacts would be of having a basic income at a national level in Scotland. Critically, it was also important that the feasibility study and the government therefore informed about how feasible would it be to have a basic income. Um, was there enough political support that not only would this government be able to introduce it, but it could run for long enough that future governments would also support the pilot, the evaluation, and ultimately, if it was decided to introduce it nationally, whether it would continue, would it be embedded into the Scottish policy framework going forward? The institutional aspects of feasibility, um, I've already suggested you know, institutions are very complex everywhere, but in the Scottish case and in the Basque country, in Catalonia and so forth, you have a national government, you have the, the governments below that, as well as cities um, below that and so forth. So in the Netherlands, we've got a number of experiments in, in Dutch cities because um, their law allows those cities to be able to introduce pilot basic incomes. The position in Scotland, Wales, other parts of the United Kingdom is different. 
So they had to see what sort of institutional framework was there. Was it compatible? Was it feasible to introduce a base income? Um, psychologically, um, would it be socially acceptable? Would the general public accept the idea of a base income as a pilot and then more generally? Uh, at one of the COP meetings I was at yesterday, we talked about a social license. Were the public giving us the license for a just transition? Similarly, would they give the license? Would they find it acceptable to have a, a basic income? And finally, we'd need to design the basic income so we could look at the outcomes, the impacts um, across society, within households, by individuals and so on. What were the unintended consequences? How do we know about them? How would we model them? And that would be true of work, uh, participation in the workplace, um, family decisions and so forth. And also, as Reinhardt raised, what would be the health impacts, etc. cetera. Um, like any basic income, the, the feasibility study group accepted and worked with authorities and the government to say, we will assume, and everybody else signs up to the idea of the basic definition of a basic income. So payments under it would be regular into a bank account or similar. Um, it would be paid to the individual, not to the household. And we've argued very strongly um, that that is quite a critical element of a basic income. All adults get it regardless, but also children will get a basic income, not maybe at the same rate and so forth. It will be universal. So everybody will get it um, in the population and for a pilot within the site where the pilot was being undertaken. So we decided in Scotland, if there were going to be pilots, it wouldn't be on particular groups as in Finland, for instance, rather it would be um, everybody living in a geographical area and it would be unconditional and it couldn't be withdrawn. So there couldn't be sanctions, there couldn't be conditions applied. So it had this very traditional definition of a basic income. In the feasibility study, they looked at um, what sort of levels and in the end they said the pilot should be at two different levels. One, at the, the existing welfare benefit, so security payment levels. Now, these are notoriously low in, in the UK. Um, they're much lower compared with absolutely the, the average income, but also compared with what people would get if they were in work. Um, so these are the basic rates for somebody who is unemployed in Britain. Um, these are very low amounts. So... What's that? About 80 euros for somebody between 25 and 65. Um, 85 euros a week to live on entirely. Um, the, so they proposed that the lower level of a base income pilot would be around those levels. And that would, because of the unconditionality, it was suggested to those who were on benefits already that you would the stigma of being um, having to earn your benefits, of threatened to be sanctioned, of having all benefits stopped, those would be removed under basic income. And so we could evaluate what was the impact of, of removing that stigmatization. Um, but also everybody else who, who was living in the area would also receive the basic income regardless of, of what incomes they were on. And they also proposed a higher level, one that was at the, the poverty rate, that would be enough, the minimum income standards for poverty um, amongst people. Um, so MIS, the minimum income standard for a working age single person was much more, was that about three times what you get on a welfare payment. So it suggested there'd be a high level of a basic income would be paid um, in, in a different pilot area so we could compare the impacts on reducing poverty on people's behaviour and um, ability to set up a new business, to take a break from a job, to undertake training and so on. The, the 
feasibility study identified another few aspects of proposals. So they said it should there should be a year to prepare to identify everybody in an area to make sure they had their own bank accounts, who was eligible and so forth. And then the pilot would run for three years and then the evaluation would take a year or two. So this was going to be quite an extensive pilot period. Um, said population, when we'd chosen a pilot area, everybody would be paid it. So it would be a saturation. Um, just in, in working out the costs of running a base income pilot, we'd need to account for inflation, build that in. And tax interactions. Um, the base income could be taxable. So it'd be roughly the, for some at the level of the, the allowance where you don't pay tax, but beyond that, it would be taxable. Um, so there was very good, a lot of work put into thinking about the feasibility of a basic income, where it would run, how it would run, for how long and so forth. The detail here isn't important, apart from saying there is a lot of detail. So this was the evaluation. How would we evaluate a basic income pilot in an area of Scotland? We look at short-term outcomes of the usual impacts on poverty and so forth, health, etc. Um, and that would become apparent during the pilot period. Um, intermediate outcomes, which would be a bit wider than the area itself, maybe take longer to come through longer term outcomes, which may take years to become apparent. So we need to model those probably rather than being able to observe them during the pilot period. And these mapped onto the, the national strategies, the national performance framework, as it's called in Scotland, of tackling poverty, um, looking after people, improving their health, making them more active and so forth. As I said, um, during COVID, the Scottish Government established the Citizens' Assembly to look at a whole range of issues and factors of, of coming out of the, the, the epidemic, the pandemic. And the people on that, who were just ordinary people drawn from across the population, voted um, to almost two thirds were in favour, agreed with the idea of a basic income for everybody to be paid in Scotland as a way to overcome the, the impact of the pandemic. So here we had it really come to the fore. And as I said earlier, the Scottish government um, in their pronouncements last year said, we thought it was worth looking at a basic income, but because of the pandemic, because of COVID, we now think it should be introduced as a matter of urgency. The, the interest in basic income um, has grown quite markedly over the last two years right across the United Kingdom. Um, so in Wales and Northern Ireland, we now have basic income groups. Um, we have national groups. I've picked out some of them there who are active across the United Kingdom. And we see them in many of the cities and quite a few of the, the mayors in English cities have said we're in favour of base income. The Welsh government is at the moment is looking at the feasibility of a pilot within Wales. Um, and within the UK government or parliament, today there was a debate in the Welsh um, select committees, it's called, of looking at a base income proposal for Wales. And there's lots of other organisations. So, Everything seems to be done to actually have pilots in Scotland. Why hasn't it happened? There are some key barriers, and the key barriers are the United Kingdom government and United Kingdom departments. Because, particularly for Scotland, which has far more powers than any, anywhere else in the UK, more than any of the English cities and the Welsh government and the Welsh Assembly, and same in Northern Ireland, the Scottish government has far more powers, but it can't introduce a basic income, even as a pilot, without the agreement of the UK government. And in particular, the, the Welfare Department, Department of Works and Pensions at the UK level, 
or the tax authority, HMRC, and behind them, the Treasury. Um, I've written about that in a few places, and again, there's hints there. So where are we at? We don't actually have pilots in Scotland, nor anywhere else in the United Kingdom, because nowhere has sufficient powers to be able to introduce it. Powers over finance, powers over welfare benefits, and so on. And therefore, one of three things has to happen. Either the UK government must change its view on basic income, and it's always been very, very brief in its responses of just saying, no, we think the future um, to get people out of poverty is they, they have to go to work, despite the fact two thirds of everybody in poverty in the UK is actually in a, a household where there are working people. So making um, work pay hasn't actually been successful in reducing poverty. So if the UK government isn't going to change, then either we need devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament, to the, the Welsh Assembly and so forth, or in the Scottish case, independence. In the meantime, what are the Scottish government doing? The, it's newly elected. It's a coalition between the Scottish National Party, the Nationalists, and the Green Party of Scotland. And together they've put into their programme for government the idea of a minimum income guarantee. Um, this is just from their press release. They're looking at how to introduce it at the moment. Um, it, it very much says we're going to support delivery of a minimum income guarantee within current powers of the Scottish Parliament. It's also going to look at what further powers might be looked at in the longer term. And that's why people in Scotland who are in favour of basic income support the idea of a minimum income guarantee, but we do have concerns that it's not enough, partly because it's not paid to the individual, it's paid to the household, and therefore it has implications um, for women in particular. Um, so across the UK, we have alliances between governments and authorities at the sub-UK level, we have a lot of planning and advocating and campaigning for basic income, but at the moment we're in the position where nothing can happen until either there's a change in national government or UK government, or there's a change in the powers given to Scotland, Wales, and so forth. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for this uh, um, in this this overview of the situation in in Scotland. I think it was quite clear uh, on this. And what what has taken me uh, just right at the beginning, and it was also what uh, combining a little bit with uh, what Julian has said before, is uh, if we really want to implement uh, a basic income um, or a pilot at least, but then also for to have it as a base for for to to bring in basic income in different levels. We need to have to allow to align the the debate from above and from down. So let's say we need the political level, and we need also uh, that people have an interest in. Um, I hear my sound is very weak, so I try to put it better. Um, so I think we need these both parts: uh, politic politics and uh, the convincing of the people uh, that this is or could be uh, a solution or a solution or at least a way uh, to fight poverty and to guarantee a, 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 a welfare life for people uh, that we don't uh, put it in con uh, in connection with it has to have work or not work because work as you said already is not the part which is guaranteeing that uh, that this uh, uh, gives a, 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 a suitable life for everyone if you have work this is not fighting against poverty okay so thanks for these two things i just want to because of the time also i would like to open the floor because i have a, a more general question but if there is a concrete question to um, the situation what both of them have described um and i see there is one uh 
Uh, what role does a regulation of living costs, uh, example, rent caps, uh, controls, and redu reducing power of private companies in public life have to play ensuring UBI could be effective in reducing inequality? So I don't know who wants from you to wants to say something to this question, maybe? Yeah, well, uh, I would like to say something about um, that health stuff that was asked before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if possible, um, because um, well, if even uh, yeah, first, uh, well, it was taken into account physical health, mental health, self-perceived health, sleep deprivation, and the use of healthcare services. Okay, and even. If it was expected that uh, those families in the treatment group uh, would improve their health and reduce their use of health services, the reality was that there were no changes in this sense. All right. So, contrary to expectations, uh, improvements uh, in the individual well being dimension that was seen doesn't necessarily translate into better uh, health outcomes. So, trends. Um, are very clear, uh, Cinder. For example, there was no effect in the probability of having a serious health problem. Or um, there are, for example, significant changes uh, in self-perceived health. So we know that mm, poor self-perceived uh, health is a very strong predictor of uh, lower life satisfaction. In fact, um, it's estimated that those people who report being in poor health uh, have on average 0 0.8 points lower levels of uh, life satisfaction than the rest. And just to finish, one of the most uh, remarkable results uh, in the experiment is that that program, that pilot, um, had no effect on the risk of developing uh, mental health related problems. So the effect goes in the expected direction. There is a generally negative sign has a negative correlation, so it reduces the probability of affecting mental health, but it's not statistically significant. So these results, and that's why it's remarkable, differs from the preliminary results, where a significant reduction of nine points, uh, nine percentage points, points in the risk of mental illness was detected. So this uh, reversal of the trend has two possible explanations. One. Uh, it's that effect on mental health, uh, it's very short-term effect. And the second one, which is more likely, I think, is that in the last phase uh, of the survey of the program, uh, the effects of the program have uh, begun to, to disappear in that expectation uh, on, the, on the end of the BEMI income. So that could be also that time limitation, uh, the staff, and maybe because of that, it's not statistic statistically significant. Thank you very much, Julian. And I hope, uh, Reinhard, this is uh, fine with you for, for your question you have asked before. And coming back to the other question, uh, Mike, you want to, to say something about the question of Ruby? Yes, and maybe just continue on that. Um, it's interesting that in, in Finland and in the Dutch cities and their evaluations, they actually find yet quite low impact which itself is interesting because a lot of the critics of base income would say people won't work, they'll sit around, they'll become unhealthy, um, they won't look for jobs. That, that wasn't what they found. Um, there were some positive impacts in both of those, but they were particularly positive where there were additional support given. So helping people to look for work tended to have beneficial effects for those who were on basic income. So, mm -hmm. and in the same way, we've never, we've never claimed that basic income was the panacea that would solve everything. Um, so we, we've had two quite extensive sets of workshops. The second was actually on mental health and basic income, which we reported on earlier this year. Um, but the first one, we looked at basic income and various aspects of life, one of which was housing. And we worked with homeless people and housing charities. And, and we decided that um, basic income wouldn't solve our housing crisis. Houses will solve our housing crisis. Um, controls on rents will, and so on. So 
other things been equal, if you just gave some people this basic income, it might lead to house inflation even more, or rents being put up by landlords, by owners of houses for rent. Um, and therefore we said, we need complementary things to go alongside a basic income, which we, we should be doing anyway, such as rent controls, more housing, helping homeless people to come off the streets, um, in many cases, deal with their mental health issues and drug problems and so on. Um, so to answer that question, uh, yeah, we, we need these complementary policies, strategies, actions, activities, but we should be doing them anyway. And I hope that answers. Yeah, that's that's good what you say because uh, I think uh, well we you know we have these days the COP started in uh, in Glasgow, uh, talking about uh, trying to find an agreement on the climate change uh, uh, and to reduce the the uh, the aspect uh, of climate change. At the same time, we know that all what we are doing is not there is not a magic uh, solution for something. It's only it's the possibility or it's the the, the necessity of to have different uh, tools which can face different parts of the problem. In generally, the problem is a big one, yes, and we can take it into small faces, but we can with not one tool, uh, we will not solve not the climate change, not the health uh, situation, not the housing system. Anyway, uh, uh, the UBI is a part of maybe a solution. And this is, uh, I think this is important to point it out and uh, to, to, ha to have it clear that when we talk about it, this is one of, uh, of a, a lot of measures we need uh, in this and what, what is necessarily. And uh, just coming back to, to the situation in Scotland, where I think, uh, okay, on one hand, um, on one hand, you have the uh, Uh, you have the blocking of the um, of the government of the UK government, and you cannot decide about uh, uh, to have a, a pilot on this, because one of my questions was now what is also not helping uh, the UK and not Scotland, was the idea: Do we need something like a European pilot? Uh, uh, do we need a pilot which is? Uh, and I don't want to talk there about Europe and Brexit and so on, but it is what what I think what is uh, one point of the pilots is we. We have different realities in the countries, yes, but we are also testing different points. So it makes it for a long, and, and I think Julian, you, you know it better because you have seen all the different pilots. It makes it complicated to compare them uh, and to bring some really, uh, to bring really the UBI as a tool for a solution of one aspect. So the point is, uh, do we maybe need something Uh, what takes the uh, a, a pilot which takes the national uh, situation into account, but to have mm, comparable uh, uh, criteria for what we can, what we when at least can you can use in the European uh, uh, and UK area uh, for the for the same time. Maybe you use you tell us your ideas about this question before we close our our webinar on this. Yeah, well, I think um, a European UBI, mm, not project, a European UBI could be really, really beneficial for us um, for different, different aspects. But of course, uh, guaranteeing the material existence of everybody in the European Union or in the European continent, whatever <laughs> it means, um, could be really, really um, beneficial for everybody. It could give us also freedom that we don't have right now. It will help also to um, make that European integration into something really um, tangible, no? really we can see it, um, not uh, as we have right now, the European Union. It could also give us some, um, be, um, I'm uh, sorry, how to say that, um, sentimiento de pertenencia, a feeling of uh, belonging, belonging. Mm. To the European Union, we've yeah. got a project that people don't belong part of it, of that project. A UBI could make that. Mm -hmm. It could also help us to stop that that um, brain drain. I mean, capital going from one country to another because they have no opportunities in their country. And of course, it could make us also 
uh, fiscal transferences from one country to another. But that's the European Union. I mean, if you want to be in the European Union, you know that the European Union goes to that uh, Rawlsian principle of maximin. And that's what's happened. And yeah, I think that's enough <laughs> for thank the you. moment before thank I'm you. going to up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mike, you also want to say something? Yeah, just briefly. The, yeah, the idea of solidarity and so forth. Um, and we see it more strongly in, in the north and the west of Europe. Um, and and the, those who were in the, the European Union for longer actually appreciate the solidarity more than perhaps the accession states who are still struggling with legacies. Um, there are There is a petition to the European Parliament, I believe it is, across the whole of Europe, and people are trying to sign up from each country. There are also plans for a world UBI, which would vary by country, um, the United Nations has published plans for the whole of Latin America, for instance. And, and if, if, if you think in, in the invasion of Afghanistan, one of the reasons was to stop opium being created. It didn't take much money, you know, to persuade farmers to come out of growing poppies into foodstuffs. Um, those who are burning the Amazon forest to feed their families to get money. They're not getting a lot of money. A basic income would give them an alternative, um, which would, and so forth. So that's why I said it, it's important. It should be on the table at COP26. Again, it's for solidarity across the world because people across the world, particularly the poor, are those most affected by climate change. Thank you very much, both of you. And yes, uh, uh, if it will be on the table of uh, the COP26, uh, we will see, but at least it's on the table of the Green Hub you can find in the uh, COP, uh, which is organized uh, together with a different organ green organization. And a big part of this is also the Green European Foundation, where we try to put this issue of UBI also on the table and to, to bring it up there. And as it was mentioned also in the chat, there is going on still a European citizen initiative uh, on uh, UBI so where you still can sign you can find it in the in the uh, in the chat but before we close here uh, we a lot of what we have talked about now and what you have uh, what what uh, was the base of of this uh, debate today the pilots you can find this in our um, in our online course and we would like to give you a short uh, view into it if now my colleagues sharing the screen what we cannot hear okay it doesn't doesn't matter, we cannot hear it, but as you see, it's an interactive uh, online course where you find the examples of pilots in the different countries uh, and where we try to collect it. So it's one part of, uh, of what we are uh, facing in the, in the online course. Um, have a look on it. Uh, we want to try to get the information together, to gather it and to spread it more. So thank you, first of all, uh, for the two speakers here. We, as Jeff, we will follow up with this issue in the next uh, in the next years, and hopefully, we'll see. We all will see that UBI will be part of our reality in the future. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you much, much for being with us. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.